The Man Who Would Not Die, Part Two, by Harold Ward. A Paranormal Mystery, originally published in The Black Mask, Volume One, Number Six, September 1922. Previously in The Man Who Would Not Die. In bustling 1920s New York City, the shocking news of Mrs. Winter's death sent ripples through the crowd. The young wife of millionaire Augustus Winters was found lifeless on the sidewalk, a spectacle surrounded by curious onlookers and policemen. But the plot thickens when Inspector Des Moines arrived, only to reveal that Mrs. Winters had, in fact, died the previous afternoon. Inspector Des Moines found himself entangled in a web of enigmas. How could Mrs. Winters be dead and yet be implicated in a diamond heist the very next day? Who was the mastermind behind these perplexing events? Then came the twist, a letter from a madman named Lessman, claiming responsibility for Mrs. Winter's death and boasting about his power over life and death. He called himself the man who would not die, challenging the inspector with his sinister plans. As the story unfolded, suspicion cast its shadow on Augustus Winters, the bereaved husband. The enigma deepened as Winters seemed to be in two places at once, throwing the investigation into turmoil. Was he a grieving husband or the architect of a diabolical plot? The Man Who Would Not Die, Part One, left us at the edge of our seats with mysteries unsolved and questions unanswered. What secrets lie in the heart of this chilling tale? Sit back for the gripping conclusion in Part Two. Chapter Seven Death at 1416 Broadway Human nature is peculiar. A circus always advertises a thriller as its chief attraction. People attend in the hope of seeing the performer make the one little miscalculation that will end fatal. The newspapers had heralded the announcement sent them by Lessman in huge type. Their front pages shrieked forth in colored ink and huge type the news that at ten o'clock the mysterious man who in his letter confessed to the murder of Mrs. Winters and her maid would take another life. For miles, people came for the purpose of enjoying what promised to be a thrilling spectacle. A score of policemen attempted to stem the tide, but without success. Around 1416 Broadway, the street was packed for blocks in either direction. Even the reserves were called into action. In front of 1416, a knot of policemen, headed by Inspector Des Moines in person, waited stolidly, silently, in a suppressed fever of excitement, like soldiers waiting the signal for an attack. About them the crowd surged and stormed, but bent upon keeping the fiend from carrying out his threat, Des Moines had cleared the street for a space of nearly a hundred feet, holding the curiosity seekers back with his cordon of blue coat. Hundreds of automobiles were caught in the vortex of humanity, their drivers unable to either go forward or to back out. The officers were forced to let well enough alone. To handle the jam was a task beyond the power of the guardians of the law. In one of the machines, Des Moines recognized the pale, haggard face of Augustus Winters. The millionaire, huddled up in the back seat, his every movement showing the mental strain under which he was laboring, caught the inspector's eye and beckoned. Des Moines shouldered his way through the mass of humanity to the side of his automobile. I've been caught in the crowd, inspector, and we're unable to get out. Can't you help us? You can understand the awful agony that I am suffering at such a time. Des Moines shook his head. Don't you realize, Mr. Winters, that if it were humanly possible, I'd have this street cleared and keep it cleared. My men are working in from the outside. But it'll be a job of ours, I'm afraid. But my God, man, you are not going to allow this murder to take place, are you? Des Moines shrugged his shoulders. Out of the hundreds of thousands of people packed in this vicinity, Mr. Winters, show me how to pick out the one man, the man I want. My hands are tied. There is nothing for me to do. I must bide my time and wait for the fiend to strike. Suddenly, the aged millionaire clutched the other's shoulder. His eyes dilated. He leaned forward, his muscles twitching, his face ashen and drawn. Oh, God! he shrieked. It's happening! Look! Look! His long, skinny forefinger pointed far out over the heads of the crowd, and then he fell in a heap on the bottom of the car in a dead faint. Grismoins leaped upon the running horde of the machine and gazed in the direction Winters had pointed. Then, with a yell, he jumped to the ground, and hurling people to the right and left, plunged through the mass of humanity like a maddened bull. For Officer Ryan, a strapping figure of a man with the muscular figure of an athlete who, a second before, had been in the prime of health, had suddenly thrown his arms in the air. 
For an instant he wove backwards and forwards, his face twisted, every muscle tensed, as if struggling against the unseen hands that were pulling him down. Then he gave voice to a shrill, hideous, agonized scream, and, lurching like a drunken man for a pace or two, crumpled up in a heap on the pavement. A dozen of his brother officers leaped to his assistance. They were hurled back as if by an electric shock. Arising, they fought against the invisible force that held them in its power, but without avail. Open-mouthed, their feet fastened to the pavements as by steel bands, they were forced to stand and watch the torture of their comrade. As Des Moines broke through the edge of the crowd, the unknown power that held them in check lessened. In a body they dashed to the stricken man's side and turned him on his back. His eyes were already glazing. His hands were cold and clammy. On his forehead was the sweat of death. He shivered spasmodically. Then his jaw dropped. Lessman had struck. The man who would not die had won another victory. Silence. Tense, nerve-wracking silence. Eyes were peering. Heads moving. On all sides excitement was visible on every face. But no one spoke a word. The agony was too great. Boom! High up in a tower, a clock was striking. Every eye was turned towards it, but still no word, only the soul-straining, awful silence. Boom! Boom! The clock was striking ten. Lessman had kept his word to the minute. A woman screamed. Her shrill, hysterical shriek broke the spell. Then over the heads of the silent, awe-filled crowd rang a burst of laughter, cold, haunting, diabolical laughter, weird, mysterious, the gloating of a fiend. Pandemonium broke loose. Those in the front lines, frozen with supernatural terror, turned white-faced from the horror that they had witnessed and sought an avenue of escape. None knew but the arch-fiend might continue, that any moment others might fall, blasted like a tree after a lightning stroke. Men fought and struggled to flee from the invisible. Who knew? Lessman might be he who stood beside you. Even now he might be seeking another victim. Nothing could stop him. He was omnipotent. Every man suspected his neighbor. The police labored with club and fist. It was like stemming the ocean's tide with a shovel. It was a panic, a riot in which the stronger trampled the weaker underfoot. There was no mercy, only a desire to escape from the spot. Men and women dropped, fainting, exhausted, dying where they fell beneath the feet of their maddened fellows. Their dying screams only added to the fright of those who rushed over them. Automobiles, their drivers, stricken by the fear that mastered all, dashed madly ahead, sluttering and crippling. The pavement, covered with dead and wounded, was like a battlefield. It was a miniature hell, an inferno created by the diseased brain of a devil in human form. When the officers had finally completed their task and the street was cleared, when the last ambulance had departed with its ghastly load, Des Moines looked about him for winters. He was gone. An officer remembered seeing the millionaire's machine driving away, its owner huddled up in the back seat, shrieking and babbling, his shoulders shaking with hysterical sobs, his face wearing the look of a man who has just escaped from Hades. The inspector stood deep in thought. He said that he'd speak to me. And yet, damn it all, the man never lived who could act such a part. It can't be him. And with a shake of his head he returned to his duty. Chapter 8 The Master In a lonely house in one of the outlying districts, a house set down in the midst of great trees and gardens, surrounded by a high stone wall, dwelt a man of extraordinary powers. To his neighbors he was merely an oriental gentleman of wealth and refinement, who preferred solitude in an alien country to a position of magnificence and power in his own. But to the initiate, that little band of followers selected from every walk of life, he was the ambassador of a tiny group of learned men who, for centuries before Jesus, the Christ, walked upon this earth, have been striving to bring about the regeneration of the world. Their representatives are to be found in every large center of population, working quietly, unostentatiously, teaching, preaching, gaining an occasional recruit, ever content to bide their time, knowing that years are but seconds in the general scheme of the universe. Muhammad Ganga, the Master, as he was known to those who loved and obeyed him, was a truly wonderful man. Taken, when a child, by the Holy Ones, his life had been dedicated by them to the service of his fellow creatures. Masters of mystery, delving far beyond the comprehension of ordinary humans into the phenomena of life, they had poured their combined wisdom into his open ears. And, their task completed, 
they had sent him out into the world, as they had sent many others before him, to spread the propaganda of the great work to which they had pledged themselves. None knew the limits of his power, none the depths of his great learning. To him all things were possible, to him life's mysteries were but commonplaces. Master of theosophy, philosophy, and the sciences, what, to the novitiate, seemed to savor of the weird, the mysterious, the occult, was to his mighty mind but the working of nature's laws. It was to the shrine of the master that Des Moines always journeyed when confronted by a puzzle past his comprehension, for the clear reasoning power of the sage untangled riddles that, to the ordinary mind, appeared beyond solution. So it was to the master that the inspector hurried as rapidly as his high-powered car would carry him after the Broadway horror had shown him the futility of his reasoning. Chapter 9 Professor Darius Lessman he found the master walking in the garden, a faraway look in his soft, dreamy eyes, in silent communion with nature. Upon the policeman's arrival, however, his face lighted up, and he shook hands warmly. For Mohammed Ganga had none of the methods of the charlatan. To his friends, his life was an open book to be read by all who cared to take the time. "'Greetings, my friend,' he smiled. "'What new problem brings you here this morning?' for I dare not hope that so busy a man as yourself would deign to make a purely social call. Come walk beside me and tell me all about it. He laughed sadly as he continued. Will you never remember, my friend, that every atom has its master and recognizes his intelligence? Have we not been taught to know that we have but to seek the way by making the profound obeisance of the soul to the bright star that burns within? Des Moines fell into step at his side and hastily sketched the events of the past thirty-six hours. For Muhammad Ganga did not keep in touch with the world. Newspapers never passed his doorway. When the inspector completed his tale, the master turned in his tracks and, placing his hands on the big man's shoulders, said in a voice that quivered with emotion, Dear friend, you have rendered the cause a greater favor than you realize by bringing your problem to me. For Lessman, in his egotism, has at last unmasked himself. Now we can fight him in the open. But I forget that you do not understand. Sit here on this bench with me and let me explain. Professor Darius Lessman is, without a doubt, the greatest intellect this or any other century has produced. He was employed at one time as teacher of psychology in a small inland college. His great ability soon brought him to the attention of the holy men to whose cause we are all devoted. You know the lengths to which they will go to further the spreading of the great work. They sought him out. He became the favorite pupil of one in whose footsteps even I am not fitted to walk. He was tried in various ways and found not wanting. He was taught all, everything. His wonderful brain grasped in a few years that which others have spent a lifetime in learning. So proficient did he become that plans were made to send him across the waters for final instruction from those, the hem of whose garments you and I may never hope to touch. The Creator of all things never intended that a man should have the brain that was bestowed upon Darius Lessman. The man is an anomaly. The devil must have had a hand in his making, and, when his training was completed, took him for his own. For Lessman, crazed by the power he found was within him, conceived the idea of living forever. He believed that he was greater than the God who created him. For months he practiced in secret, attempting to transfer his soul from one human body to another at the command of his will. Failing, he sought his old master, told him his secret, and begged him for help. When the master turned upon him in horror and loathing, he killed the good old man to protect his own devilish secret. Then he fled with a woman he had captivated by means of his diabolical wiles, a pure girl named Metavanetta, who too had been an humble pupil of the murdered master. She became Lessman's tool, his accomplice. Together they worked out Lessman's plans in some secret place, spreading death and destruction wherever they went in order to gain the human clay with which to work. We have followed them, tracking them from country to country, yet seldom daring to strike because of our knowledge that he was our superior. For Lessman is a monster, a man who laughs at death, and none has been found strong enough to kill his twisted soul. The cell was never made that could hold him for he has but to discard his body and seize upon that of another. Many men of our faith have met him. He has killed them all by the power of his will. The brain has not been made that can match his in a duel of wills. Even I am fearful of him, and I am backed by the united intelligence of the holy men who are with me in spirit night and day. His is a mind gone wild, a muck, as you would say in the vernacular. 
For years I have prepared myself for the meeting. Am I fitted for the ordeal? I tell you, my friend, the time has come. Lesman must die. We must kill him for the sake of humanity, not as one man kills another. We must kill his soul, even though we are forced to call upon the Holy Ones for aid. For the time, you must forget that you are the policeman and become the protector of mankind. We must gird ourselves for the battle, trusting in God to protect the right. Now do you understand? These moans drew a trembling hand across his brow, from which the sweat was pouring. God, he muttered hoarsely, it's horrible, unbelievable. The master patted his shoulder affectionately. I realize it, my friend, yet to a certain extent you have been trained to see that which to the ordinary mind appears obtuse. Multiply that which you know and understand by hundreds, and you comprehend my wisdom. And I am but an infant in intellect compared to Darius Lesman. The man cares for but two things, riches and power. Seek for the man who would profit most by the death of Augustus Winters, and when you have found him, return to me. Further than that I can tell you nothing. I must go now, and in prayer and meditation, prepare myself for the inevitable meeting. Chapter 10 no material progress. Inspector Des Moines left the home of the master, his head in a whirl. Although his years of experience in grappling with criminality in all of its sickening forms had made him a man far beyond the ordinary, in point of intellect, his brain was too well acquainted with the wonder-worker he had just left to doubt his veracity. He had seen the terrible power of Lessman in the case of the unfortunate Ryan. The other officers who had battled against the unseen force were unable to add any information to what he already knew. They could only say that, for the instant, a will more powerful than their own had held them in check. What it was, they could not explain, nor could they describe their sensations. Pondering over the matter, as he whirled citywards, the inspector could only shake his head. He was face to face with the greatest mystery he had ever tackled, a mystery so big that only the master himself could fathom it. As he came to a cross street, he suddenly changed his mind and directed the chauffeur to drive to the winter's home. He would again study the millionaire at close rein. He was unable to reconcile himself to the belief that the slow-witted, hysterical man of money was the enormous intellect described by Mohammed Ganga. Yet everything fitted in to make a case against winters, only to tumble to pieces at the next turn. There was the telephone call. His men had investigated. Not only was the operator ready to swear that it had been Winters who called from booth number 14, but the cigar girl as well. The man had stopped at the cigar stand for an instant. He was well known to the girl in charge, who had addressed him by name, as had the clerk on duty at the time. Yet, three minutes later, Winters had answered the telephone at his own home, ten miles away. Clearly, a man could not be in two places at the same time. Nor was it within the power of any human being, by any modern means of transportation, to transport himself that distance within the time given. Wilkins answered the inspector's ring. His master was in the parlor, sitting beside the body of his beloved wife. He would announce the inspector. A second later he returned and ushered Des Moines into the big reception hall. The inspector shook hands with the millionaire. Then, his eyes on the other's face, he plunged immediately into the reason for his call. Mr. Winters, he said, I believe that I am on the right track at last, but I need some information that only you can give me. Will you do it? There was no hesitancy on the part of the man of wealth. Ask me anything you wish, Inspector. I will answer your question to the best of my ability. Des Moines bored on. Winters, he said sharply, who is your heir? The millionaire started. Why, er, I don't understand what you are getting at, he exclaimed. Just this. If I am correct in my guess, your life is in danger. In view of this morning's happenings, I am at last firmly convinced that Mrs. Winter's death was nothing more or less than a cold-blooded murder. So, too, was the death of the maid. I will admit that several times I have had my doubt. Now I know. Winters started back, aghast. Horrible! Horrible! he cried. It is hard to believe, yet it must be true. But who could have so hated my poor wife as to take her life? The inspector continued relentlessly. With Mrs. Winters out of the way, it is my belief that you will be the next to go. We must protect you. Now who is going to profit by all this deviltry? Have you made a will? Winters put his hand to his head. Surely it cannot be true. You cannot believe that they, mere children. Who are they, man? Speak up. My nephew, Thomas Depew, and my niece, Cora Dayton, his cousin. 
Everything I have will go to them. Mrs. Winters had no near relatives. My will has been made for months. Of course, had my wife lived, she would have inherited all. Do they live in the city? They make their home with me. They have lived here since childhood. Both are orphans. I would like to talk with them, question them without their knowing the reason. Will you kindly summon them, tell them that I am merely seeking additional data for my report? Winters, white-faced, arose. I will do as you wish, Inspector, he said slowly. But you are wrong in suspecting those children. Thomas is but nineteen years of age. His cousin is nearly a year younger. Theirs cannot be the brains that planned this horrible outrage. He stepped into the adjoining room, only to reappear, an instant later, with the information that both of the young people had driven downtown for the afternoon. Inspector Des Moines left the winter's home feeling that he had made no material progress. Chapter 11 a stranger, stone dead. The funeral services for the late Mrs. Winters had been held, and the body tenderly laid away in the family vault in Rose Hill Cemetery. At the same hour in another part of the city, amid more humble surroundings, was held the funeral of Dolly Matthews, the mate. Alone in his office, Inspector Des Moines sat scanning the afternoon papers. They were still filled with criticisms of the police administration. Nor did the inspector blame them greatly, for he was obliged to confess himself beaten, defeated at every turn of the road. He had attended the funeral of Mrs. Winters in person. Several of his best plain clothes men had mingled with the crowd. Others had been present at the funeral of the maid. Their reports were one the same. There was nothing, absolutely nothing, to report. Over the telephone he had given the master the results of his interview with Winters. Mohammed Ganga had advised him to say nothing, do nothing, until Lessman again showed his hand. Lost in reverie, he went over every phase of the case. A stone wall confronted him. There was nothing upon which he could even base a theory. Even though he succeeded in pinning the crimes on Winters, what jury would believe the incredible story? There was not even a motive. He would be laughed out of court. Muhammad Ganga was his only hope. The telephone tinkled jarringly, startling him out of his daydreams. The voice which answered his gruff hello was that of a stranger, agitated, jerky, Inspector, this is Thomas Depew, Augustus Winter's nephew. For the love of God, come out here quick. Something awful has happened. I don't know what it is. I can't explain. I only know that a stranger called here shortly after we returned from the funeral and inquired for my uncle. Wilkins, the butler, heard him request a private interview. Uncle Gus took him into his study and closed the door. We supposed that he had departed, for later my uncle left the house for a short stroll, or at least we so imagined. A few minutes ago, Wilkins entered the study. He found the body of the stranger lying on the floor, stone dead. No, there was not a mark of violence on him. The physician, Dr. Bennett, has just completed his examination, and my uncle has not yet returned. Chapter 12 A throaty, diabolical, gleeful burst of mirth. Over the telephone, Des Moines reported the latest angle of the case to Muhammad Ganga. Then he drove to the latter's residence and picked him up on his way to the winter's home. The white-faced butler admitted them, trembling like a leaf as he ushered them into the presence of young Depew, a slender youth trying hard to appear manly in spite of his agitation. A moment later they were joined by Miss Dayton, the niece, a beautiful girl whose eyes were swollen and red from weeping, although she seemed to hold herself under better control than did the boy. The inspector briefly introduced the master as one of his men versed in subtle poisons, brought along for the purpose of detecting if any such had been used in making away with the stranger found in the study. A hasty examination of the dead man proved the correctness of young Depew's report. He was a rough-appearing individual, evidently a laborer, far from the sort of person a man of winter's refinement and wealth would be likely to be on intimate terms with. Mohammed Ganga arose from the stooping position over the dead man and turned to Depew. Darius Lessman, he said in the conversational tone of one polished gentleman addressing another, the time for unmasking is at hand. We meet at last. It is your soul or mine. Prepare yourself for the ordeal. Summon, if you are able, the powers of darkness. I warn you that behind me lies all of the great strength of the Holy Ones, and only you know what that means. Are you ready for the trial? For an instant there was silence. Then, with a wild shriek, the girl ran screaming from the room. Des Moines stepped back a pace, startled by the sudden accusation. Yet he knew the master too well to doubt the correctness of his charges. 
Deep Pew's eyes glared angrily. He seemed about to leap at the throat of his accuser. Then, with a shrug of his thin shoulders, he chuckled, a throaty, diabolical, gleeful burst of mirth. As you wish, my dear Mohammed Gunga, as you wish, I will warn you as you have warned me. I intend to kill you, damn you. Yes, and the infernal meddler with you, too. I'll kill you as I killed the others. He rubbed his hands together gleefully, giving way again to his unholy mirth. Yes, and by God, I'll use your carcasses as I use this piece of carrion on the floor there. Think you that you can stop me, that you in your littleness can end a career such as mine. I am Lesman, the man who cannot die. I'll be chief of police for a day. <laughs> yes, and I'll wear the robes of the master. Listen, fools. Meta, the woman I love, is she who has just left the room. Together we killed Mrs. Winters. Blasted her as we will blast you. Yes, I'll blast you, curse you. I can throw my will across the continent. Think you, then, that you can defeat me. I got Des Moines here to end him, knowing that he would bring you along. With you gone, the world is mine. In the body of Mrs. Winters, Meta left this house. She came here in the body of Dolly. Ha, ha, ha! It was a puzzle for the fools of policemen, trying to figure out how the body of the maid got into the coffin of the mistress. I love puzzles. I worked it all out to attract your attention, as I knew it eventually would. My dear Mohammed Gunga, you were getting too close to my tracks, you and your hellish gang. With you gone, none will be left on this side of the water who can hope to match their strength with mine. My only regret is that I didn't blast that damned salesman, Johnson, who blocked our game when we stole the brooch. I was the chauffeur, as you have already guessed. I grew tender-hearted. Fool that I am. When he seized Meta, he forced her to quit the body she was occupying and enter that of the dead woman we had in the machine, ready for just such an emergency. I'll get him yet, though, damn him! I killed Winters, Inspector, the same night that I telephoned to you. Huh, it was funny. I left his body hidden in a room I keep downtown for just such purposes. Then I threw my soul across the space and into the body I now occupy in time to answer your telephone call. I knew that you would trace the call and seek to trap me. I wanted to puzzle you. It has been a real pleasure for me to play with you. For I give you credit for having more intelligence than the average detective. I knew that sooner or later, though, you would get beyond your depth and call for aid from Mohammed Gunga. Where is Winter's body hidden now? That's my business, fools. It's hidden away where I can use it again if the occasion ever demands, after Meta and I get through using the Winter's millions, possibly. Your policeman? Oh, yes, I killed him. Blasted him from the automobile while I was talking to you. I kept my promise, did I not? And now both of you prepare to die. I, Lesman, the man who will not die, will it? Chapter 13 A Tiny, Smoky, Gray Ball of Vapor Des Moines felt an icy sensation creep over him. Then came a peculiar numbness. He struggled against it. Clammy fingers seemed to clutch his throat. He was choking. He staggered like a drunken man, seeking an avenue of escape. A veil of darkness seemed to weigh upon his eyes. Tighter and tighter grew the bands about him, and, then screaming like an hysterical woman, he fell to the floor, unconscious. How long he lay there he never knew, probably only a few seconds. He awakened suddenly. For an instant he imagined himself dead. He opened his eyes. Over him stood the master, calm, self-reliant, facing the monster. Silently the two men, only a few yards apart, waged the greatest battle the world will ever know, the battle of wills, a duel between the powers of darkness and the forces of good. Slowly, 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 Lesman seemed to weaken. Great drops of sweat stood out on his forehead. His breath came in asthmatic pants. He struggled to save himself, to concentrate his powerful will for a final effort, but in vain. Opposed to him was a will greater than his own the united will of the thousands who had devoted their lives to the work of uplifting mankind, the will of the holy men of India. His legs trembled, his fingers twitched jerkily. Then, as he sank to the floor, he made a final effort to escape. From his body emanated a thin vapor, an aura. It was his soul attempting flight. It spread across the room like a nauseous miasma, smoke-like, cloudy, repellent, hellish, in response to the master's will, it drew itself together, slowly, oh so slowly, 
As if fighting to the very last, it drew nearer and nearer to the man to whose mind it acknowledged the mastery. At last it was but a tiny, smoky, gray ball of vapor. The master held forth his hand, and it hovered over his palm. He pressed his fingers together. When he opened them, a tiny particle of grayish powder lay within his hand. Through the house rang the blood-curdling shriek of a woman, a single despairing wail of anguish. Then through the door floated another wraith. For a second it hesitated. Then it mingled with the ashes of its lover in the master's hand. Muhammad Ganga blew upon his palm. The powder vanished into nothingness. He extended his hand to Des Moines and assisted him to his feet. That is the end. Only you and I know the truth. Let us depart. The monster is dead. The end. If you enjoyed this thrilling paranormal mystery, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Click the notification bell to be notified when a new story drops.